So thank you for joining us uh, for today's webinar called uh, What You Need to Know About E-Commerce, Logistics, Customs, and Regulations. Uh, my name is Evan Buey, and I work for Alberta Agriculture and Forestry as an International Initiatives Officer, uh, specifically focusing on the export readiness and market intelligence files. So before we get into our feature presentation, uh, just a quick uh, overview uh, kind of of the programs and services that my team offers uh, to help support Alberta agriculture companies. Uh, we recently went through a little internal uh, restructuring. We're now called the export development team. Um, so we specialize in supporting agriculture, food and beverage companies export to international markets. Uh, we help to facilitate workshops and training sessions such as today's. We generate market intelligence for companies so we can find you a wealth of information in relation to your sector and products category, as well as consumer trends and insights. Uh, we also monitor market access issues and help, help companies navigate the, the free trade agreements out there. Uh, so prior to the pandemic, um, we were very uh, present at um, the major agricultural trade shows around the world. Um, well, hopefully we'll get there one day. Uh, again, but for now we're, we're attending virtually like everyone else or utilizing our in-market staff. So these in-market staff are located in our 13 international offices um, and counting in various locations uh, in Asia, Southeast Asia, Europe, and North America. Uh, a number of these offices have dedicated agriculture specific staff within them who are experts of the local economy and are extremely valuable assets uh, to Alberta industry. We also work closely with the federal government through the Trade Commissioner Service to tap into their expertise, networks, and buyer connections to help companies enter those markets. Uh, so that's really us in a nutshell, but if you're looking for more information, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. My information is there on the screen. All right, well, I'd now like to introduce our presenter, uh, Christian Sivier with Solimpex. So following a 30-year career in international logistics, in Europe and Canada, Christian started a Montreal-based import-export consultancy in 2010 called Solimpex, uh, which is active in two main areas, consulting and coaching to help SMEs grow internationally, as well as training on the logistics, customs, and regulatory aspects of international trade, uh, importing, exporting, free trade agreements, supply chain management, and other related issues. So Christian also lectures for CIFFA, which is the Canadian International Freight Forwarders Association in Toronto, and FITA, the World Federation of Freight Forwarders in Zurich. He also gives seminars and webinars for various trade organizations and provides personalized training for importers and exporters. So with that, Christian, I'll, I'll pass it on over to you. Thank you very much, Evan, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, thank you to Alberta Agriculture and Forestry for the inv invitation to speak to you. It's really nice to be together in these times where our um, in-person activities are limited. So it's really nice that technology gives us the opportunity to, to, to be together. Um, the year is still young, so I think we can still celebrate the fact that um, the year uh, 2021 is uh, going to be the year of the vaccines, of uh, the vaccines, which I think is great. It's good news. It's slow starting, but uh, it's uh, still good and uh, good news. And uh, we'll take that anytime. Um, and also, we had a um, smooth transition of power in the U.S., uh, which is also very good news. Uh, it looked for a while like it was not going to be that peaceful um, or that smooth a transition. Um, but um, now to talk about exporting the, the um, uh, logistics and regulatory and customs aspects of e-commerce. There's a lot of information. I want to share a lot of information with you. I hope it will be useful and I look forward to exchanging with you at the end of the webinar. We've slated an hour and a half. I'll try to, to maintain a good pace so that we have time at the end. Um, for exchanges and discussions. I don't need to introduce myself because Evan did it already uh, and he did it very well. Um, 
So one uh, stat I wanted to share with you before we begin um, is to show you the uh, proportion of um, our exports that go to the US. So whether we are traditional uh, doing traditional exporting or e-commerce, I think it uh, comes out the same. We all know the US is our first market by far. It represents about three quarters of our exports. Um, and it's been stable over the year, uh, over the years, sorry. We don't have the 2020, I think actually we, we should get them very soon, but I'm sure the proportion will be about the same. Um, some years it's 76, some there is 75, but three quarters of uh, three quarters of our total exports end up in the US. So therefore it's an extremely important market for us. And we're happy that there was a, tra a smooth transition of power. We're also happy that the new free trade agreement was renewed and was uh, put in place um, in July last year. Um, actually is the European Union uh, and then followed by China. So just to clarify a little bit the uh, what we're going to talk about and also to make a little parallel between uh, traditional exporting and between e-commerce exporting, selling internationally via e-commerce. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, the, the, the traditional exporting, which I'll call classic exporting, deals mainly with transactions. We basically most of the time sell to companies or to governments or government agencies or um, rather large organizations, sometimes small organizations, but sometimes large organizations. Um, but ba basically uh, uh, companies that are structured and that have a certain knowledge of uh, or a good knowledge of uh, um, importing and exporting or of customs issues, of regulations issues, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we also very often in traditional, in the traditional way of exporting, we also often deal with uh, agents or we work with visitors, agents who represent us, uh, importers who buy a product and then distribute them in the country uh, that we're selling to. And uh, so that of course is a little different from e-commerce because when we were selling with e-commerce, then um, we sell mostly to the final user, the end user of our product. So it's mainly B2C. Uh, there is some B2, B2B activity, industrial customers and our organizations purchase via e-commerce, um, via you know, the Amazons and Alibaba of this world. So we do sometimes, uh, in e-commerce deal with organizations that are structured to, to deal with imports. But most of the time we deal with customers, with the end user, and he or she is not that familiar with um, logistics, customs, uh, regulations, issues. Um, and so in most cases, or in, yeah, in almost all cases, the, the final customer um, in, in the e-commerce model will be the importer. It won't be a, a company or an intermediary who will be acting as an agent or distributor or importer. So these are, we talk about direct sales um, when we are talking about e-commerce. Payment terms are not an issue when we, for the traditional exporting, when we do these sessions for um, traditional exporters, then we talk about payment terms, we talk about payment instruments, letters of credit, documentary credits, cash against documents, transactions. We talk about credit insurance, receivables insurance offered by EDC and organizations like this, which of course is not relevant uh, for e-commerce because for e-commerce, usually you get paid as the order is, uh, um, is placed. Uh, you get paid by credit card or by, uh, you know, one of, uh, a payment um, portal like uh, um, a PayPal or, or similar. So payment is not a problem. As we know about it, we all know about it. E-commerce was growing exponentially already before uh, 
um, COVID-19 and it grew even more because for many things, for many products, we had no other choice but to buy them online since uh, March um, last year. So uh, it has continued to grow tremendously. And of course, today we're going to talk about rules and regulations and customs and, and this and that about uh, e-commerce. Now, what I wanted to say here uh, is to say that, uh, yes, there's, uh, there's, there's rules and regulations for international transactions. Now, um, governments are sometimes a bit late catching up to the evolution of troll of how sometimes our rules and regulations are a little bit outdated. They haven't kept up with the changes in, 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 uh, uh, in, in, in what is happening in reality out there. So examples, yes, I wanted to share some examples or highlight some examples here. We hear once in a while about the GAF attacks, you know, which some company, some countries want to introduce. It started in Europe. I think we are trying to do the same in Canada, even though it hasn't been uh, done yet. And so um, the fact that we're still struggling with administration of how um, re regulations are trying to catch up to what is actually happening in reality. Um, so the uh, the Facebooks and, and um, Amazons and uh, uh, Google of these of this world make a lot of money on e um, on e transactions, not necessarily directly e commerce, but uh, e transactions uh, advertise because they don't have a physical presence in the country where they make that money. So that uh, our our regulations haven't caught up to that yet. Netflix is a good issue too. If you go to a movie theater, you pay GST on the ticket. If you watch a movie on Netflix, you don't pay GST. Um, and then there's the issue of the sales tax in the US, the individual sales tax that each, each state, each US state assesses on, on retail sales. So that's a, an interesting issue. And we will see that here. Uh, we'll, we'll look at that uh, a bit later on. We'll see that there, there is a um, governments are catching up to um, to to the, the situation to practices, and so it is a factor to to know about to be familiar with when you sell by e-commerce in the U.S. Uh, as of last year or two years ago, uh, different states in the U.S. have introduced um, obligations for e-commerce retailers to all of uh, how in some places we are catching up. So we'll touch on that in a moment. And so the other thing I wanted to, to relate uh, to relate here a little bit is to say that, um, yes, the rules are the same, whether you export the, the traditional way um, or whether you export via e-commerce, via e the rules are basically the same. There's basic rules to know about. Um, of course, sometimes um, via e-commerce, there's so much e-commerce moving and going, and also um, the majority of, uh, of transactions are, are small in nature. So it's very hard actually for, for governments to enforce the rules and regulations, uh, at least sometimes. Uh, yes, governments are trying to catch up um, on taxes. We just uh, we, we just talked about, about it a second ago uh, when we talked about the US sales tax. Uh, we'll go in that later on the presentation. Food safety, yes, we're also catching up on that. Um, contraband, counterfeit goods, contraband goods. And so, and governments are trying to uh, tighten that up and uh, fight that, of course. Um, and so, um, there's also uh, with e commerce, um, even though the rules are the same, sometimes they're not necessarily applied the same way, or or they may not some some rules may not be applied at all. You may have heard it, or it may have happened to you in the past online one day, and when you received the goods, you had a bill to pay for. 
And sometimes you buy from another source or, or, it, or, or the parts or the, the, or the product you bought comes via a different channel and then you don't pay GST or duties. Um, it happens. I had a company, uh, a European company contact me actually last week about an issue they have with a shipment of pate. Hey, Christian, we uh, seem to have, have lost your screen and it's a bit choppy on our end. Uh, looks like you're muted right now, but do you want to perhaps maybe turn off your video and see if that helps things? Sorry, we um, um, if, if the uh, transmission is not very good. Sorry about that. Um, the last word I, I heard we was haven't pate. lost too much. Um, yes, what I wanted to uh, I was explaining. I was in the process of explaining was the fact that uh, I have a European company uh, that has been shipping foodstuffs to Canada via e-commerce. Yes, that's right. Um, and so uh, they contacted me because Sorry, everyone looks like Christian's having some connectivity issues. So uh, just please stand by for the moment. We'll try to get him back up and running. Thank you. Are we? Can you hear me well now? I can hear you, Christian. Yep. Can you hear me now? Yes. Are we okay to, to continue, Evan? Yeah, I think so. Just, uh, yeah, I'll. I'll kind of interrupt again if it gets really bad. You're just a little choppy and yeah, maybe you just keep your video off for the time being. Okay, great, thank you. So this example I was giving was a company that has been doing something for, that has been shipping products um, for a little while without any difficulties. And then all of a sudden, one of their ship and is because it's lacking a, um, a health Christian, we lo Christian, we lost you again. Sorry, everyone. This is my worst fear.
sorry about that. It seems we're having connection issues. Um, what I was trying to highlight was the fact that sometimes um, products go through, even though they're lacking some documentation or some certificates, and then all of a sudden, by some fluke, um, the shipment is held. And so that company was asking me how come their shipment was held. They were they never had any problems before. So what I had to explain to them was that actually they were doing it wrong before. They should have always had a health certificate with their product, but um, um, they were lucky because the goods were still going through without issues. So uh, it's just to highlight that because of the sheer number of uh, shipments that are that are transacted, you know, on a global scale, um, the rules are not always followed 100%. And uh, so nevertheless, I think the only way to look at this is to say that uh, we want to be, uh, we don't want to take any chances, we want to be familiar with the rules and regulations that apply, and we want to follow them, obviously, to avoid any potential issue. So I hope in the meantime, the connection is reasonably uh, functioning reasonably well and uh, that um, you can hear me okay. So therefore, I'll begin by giving you just a brief overview of our export regulations and uh, because they apply to e-commerce as well. So the first thing to know is when we are exporting overseas, we have an obligation to file an export declaration to the Canada Border Services Agency for any transaction valued at $2,000 and more. Uh, and we have an exemption of this uh, regulation um, of this requirement when we export to the US. So when you export to the US, don't worry about doing an export declaration. When you're exporting anywhere else, uh, so long as your, your, your transaction is, um, is, uh, reaches the $2,000 threshold, then you have an obligation to file an export declaration. It's done electronically, it's rather easy. You have to do it before shipping the goods, before the shipment uh, leaves the country. The other point I wanted to share with you was the fact that we have, in Canada, we have export permit regulations, we have export permit rules, export controls, export restrictions. And even though they cover things that may, that are not necessarily very often shipped by e-commerce or sold by e-commerce. They cover military um, and similar products, but they also cover uh, technology. So we have export controls on technology exports from Canada. And so it's our obligation as an, as an exporter, even though we may not be in this field, of course, and I realize that in your case, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be in that field, but I just want to share this with you so that you know it exists. And so, a way to look into this is to look up on the, the Global Affairs website. There's, if you type in Global Affairs, Export and Import Controls, and you go to Export Controls, and then you'll have the information on Export Controls there. The other uh, pointer I wanted to give you, I wanted to share with you today is that we have, Canada has sanctions against some countries, and so they're usually derived from United Nations sanctions. And sometimes they're limited in scope. They are restricted to certain companies uh, in these countries, et cetera, et cetera. Again, these are not the main countries, um, but uh, they, are, they are mainly small countries uh, um, with the exception of Russia, for example. But I want you to know that we have restrictions on what we export to these countries and uh, there we are, are either not allowed to export to these countries or to these to certain entities in these countries, or we have an obligation to apply for an export permit. And so this is what I wanted to share with you. And again, to find this information, just type in um, global affairs, um, current sanctions imposed by Canada, and then you will get that information. Now the basic export documentation that we have to provide with our shipments, whether we send them or sell them by e-commerce or not, we still have to produce the basic, the minimum documentation that will be required for customs at destination uh, for the goods to go through customs and uh, be um, handed over to, to the customer, to the final customer, to the final receiver. And so the main uh, piece of documentation we have to produce is the commercial invoice 
Sometimes we call it also a pro forma invoice. A pro forma invoice is used when goods are not sold, i.e. if you send replacement material that uh, needs to replace faulty uh, material that was under warranty, or if you send free samples. So this, this is where you would use a pro forma invoice. Um, otherwise you use a commercial invoice and um, uh, that's the main document that is used for customs clearance at destination and that needs to accompany the shipment, needs to be with the, uh, with the shipment. It's also customary to make a packing list, to, to prepare a packing list. I mean, of course, that's very useful if you have more than one package being sent. If you only have one package, it's not a big deal. If you have several packages and it's important to have a proper packing list that will say what is in which package, it's important from customs point of view, it's important for potential inspections. It's also important if you have a claim in the process. So the packing list sometimes if, um, if the packaging packing is limited or if you only have one package, then it's fine to call your commercial invoice a combined invoice packing list and show the appropriate information on one document only. The packing list basically tells us what is in each box and what are, what, is the, what are the dimensions of the box and what is the weight of the box. Uh, so it's fine to combine that in, in most cases uh, as a single document. Sometimes in some countries for customs purposes, we require, we need to issue certificates of origin. Uh, I'll touch on that at the end when we talk about free trade agreements. The main thing about the origin of the goods is that it's, in most cases, it's, and particularly for e-commerce, it's fine to mention the origin on the commercial invoice without having to issue an extra document, without having to issue a, an actual separate certificate of origin. So for most countries, it's quite acceptable, but uh, so just keep in mind, it's an important piece of information to show on the invoice that goes with the goods for customs purposes we need to know the origin of the product and we'll zoom in on that uh, in more a bit more detail in a moment. Packaging of course it has to be adequate to protect the, the, the goods in um, based on, on, on what the, the what the material is, what the product is, if it's fragile, if it's uh, uh, it has to be uh, the, the, the goods the product has to be protected. Um, and and um, to to avoid any any um, any damage on the way, and that also the level of packaging, I guess, could depend sometimes on the country of destination. You could say, um, but it's mainly also depending on the mode of transportation, how it's going, to, how it's being shipped there. Um, by e-commerce, we'll usually use trucks. If we're going not too far, or we'll use air, and so we have to have the packaging done appropriately. And uh, it's an important element because, you know, um, if you look at statistics for, for, for damages, for, for cargo claims, and there are stats that come every year on that, uh, about 10% of uh, damages that occur or, or, or claims that are made are, um, the, the damages were caused or, or, or came up because of improper packaging, because of insufficient, inadequate packaging. So in that case, of course, even if you have insurance, the insurance won't pay you because the insurance will say the goods weren't appropriately packaged and that's why they got damaged. So something to keep in mind, packaging is important to protect the, uh, your product, to be sure it arrives in good condition. Of course, on the other hand, uh, the um, other important element of packaging is you want to pack your goods as densely as possible so that uh, to, to minimize the, the waste, but also to minimize the, sh the shipping costs because quite often, particularly on bulky goods, the sh shipping costs are, are calculated on the volume of the shipment and not necessarily on the weight. So, um, Pack your, packing your goods as, 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 uh, as densely, as compactly as possible is a good practice. Um, you also have to know that uh, there are some, some, some goods that are regulated that are considered hazardous. Uh, so this would be flammables, this would be uh, uh, corrosive, uh, um, 
of course, for foodstuffs, we don't expect to be sending uh, hazardous materials. However, if you're sending, um, you know, um, uh, products uh, like beverages or alcohol or, or liqueurs, like if you're sending Alberta gin overseas, then it's considered a flammable liquid. So for these types of products, there are certain specific regulations that we have to follow. The packaging has to be appropriate. Uh, the, the labeling has to be specific, also identify the hazard. And the seller, the shipper, is responsible to fill out what's called the dangerous goods declaration, which we have at the bottom right-hand side of the screen. You're, not, you're generally not going to use wood packaging material when you send goods by e-commerce. Um, however, sometimes you could, if you're sending a, a few pallets of, of products to a distribution center somewhere uh, in the States or, or overseas, you know, in the UK or in Europe, uh, that, that, that happens often. Um, there you have to know, and then you would send them by ocean freight, right? To, to create a stock, to maintain a stock there. There you have to know that um, there are rules for wood packaging material to be treated. And so the, the rules are called the ISPM 15 rules, and that would apply to crates, to pallets, to any, any wood packaging material that is used to protect the goods when, when we're shipping them. And so you have to be sure that you procure treated wood, otherwise the products just won't be able to get into the country that you're sending them to. So again, as I said, this does not apply directly, of course, to e-commerce e sales, but it applies indirectly if you're shipping stock to a distribution center overseas from which you will be then making your sales and your deliveries. So it's uh, important to be aware of that. And I hope that the um, the sound is, uh, is okay. Um, Evan might confirm that. Um, or if uh, if we still have issues with that. I uh, know everything sounds good, Christian. Excellent. So when we're talking about shipping, then of course, uh, and so I, I forgot to say, I wanted to say earlier that today is really um, a summary of all the many little things that we should be aware of. And it's not going to be complete or thorough because there's just too much uh, information otherwise but so I want what I want to do with you is share the um, as much information as possible so that you know what area to to dig into further based on your products based on the market you, you're shipping sell to there's a whole um, array of regulations that we have to be familiar with depending on the products that we're shipping and, and where we're shipping them to where we're selling them to uh, so one of them that I chose to highlight was standards, you know, so depending on what product you're shipping, sometimes each country will have its, its specific standards that have to be followed. And so in Canada, for some products, we have the CSA standards. Um, in the US, for some products, there's the UL standard. In the European Union, there's, there's the CE standard. That generally does not apply to food. Uh, but I just wanted to, again, wanted to make you aware of them so that you, you know that they exist. So the CE standard is very common for sales in Europe. Uh, and then now that the UK has left the European Union, there's a new standard that came up, the UKCA. So that has to be um, um, followed for many products, but they're mainly industrial goods and not food items. So food items, it's a little different because there we have, each country has, a, has specific rules uh, for uh, standards, for also for registration, as well as uh, labeling, as well as nutritional information. So there's a whole slew of information that uh, and of rules and regulations that you have to look into. So I just wanted to highlight a few just for information, just to point you to the, to the, to, um, in, to the direction of, uh, of where you should look. So in the US, as you know, there's two agencies that regulate foodstuffs. Um, the FDA is the one that's involved that we come across the most because they regulate all food preparations and most food really that we're going to ship to sell them sell to the US. They also regulate um, um, pharmaceuticals, of course, and um, vitamins, food supplements, et cetera, et cetera. The USDA will be involved in agri products that are uh, mainly that are not transformed. Uh, and um, they'll be involved with meat and grain. Uh, 
there's a piece of legislation that was introduced a few years ago in the US called the, the Food Safety Modernization Act. And under that act, uh, have been gradually introduced um, by which we have uh, foreign suppliers have to be registered with the uh, FDA and have to renew their registration on a regular basis. It's called the Foreign Supplier Verification Program. So it's really something that uh, one has to become very familiar with if we're shipping foodstuffs uh, into the US. There's other government agencies that would be involved in the US. They I just want to show them to you, uh, highlight them just for information. Uh, and uh, what I wanted to say with this slide is that when we sell goods in the US, they have to go through customs, through US Customs and Border Protection. Everything has to go through customs. But sometimes, depending on the product we're shipping, we also have to get clearance from another government agency like the FDA or the USDA or the Federal Communications Commission, et cetera, et cetera. So depending on the type of product we're sending. For food, of course, we'll be mainly looking at FDA and USDA. Something that is also sometimes not that well known um, by, by Canadian exporters is there's, um, there's the um, Lacey Act um, regulations that deal with uh, uh, wood products whereby we have to supply a certificate, a uh, plant and plant product declaration form, uh, a PPQ 505 is what, is what it's called. And so that applies to um, products made uh, in wood. So just for information to highlight some of the regulations that vary depending on the types of products we're selling. Um, now I wanted to zoom in briefly on the, on the basic com uh, components of customs compliance. Um, we want to be sure our product goes through customs, uh, that they are not held at customs uh, for any reason. And it's our responsibility as the exporter to be familiar with these rules and regulations and with the requirements, even though in the end it's the customer who is going to be uh, the importer. But still, we are the ones who are going to prepare the documentation so that goods go through uh, customs without issues. So I just want to share the main components of customs compliance. Of course, there would be a lot more to say about it, but um, just make you um, to, to, to alert you to these uh, requirements. So the first one we'll touch on is the product, uh, the tariff classification. Um, then we'll touch on valuation, origin, and intellectual property. So product description, what does that mean? That means that when we export goods and when they go through customs, whether by traditional exporting or via e-commerce, when they go through customs, customers will look at the document that accompanies the goods the commercial invoice, and then they'll look at the description. So we should be sure that the description we put on our commercial documentation um, is clear and, 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 and easy to understand for a customs officer. So we have to describe the product properly and uh, be a bit uh, beware of brand names or model, model names and, and that. So let's describe the product precisely so that a customs officer will see what is this uh, this product? What is this shipment? What is in that box? So the, one of the examples I like to, to use to illustrate that what I mean here is uh, if you're the Samsung company and you're shipping galaxies, if all you show on your invoice, on your commercial document is that you're shipping galaxies, a customs officer reading that would, would uh, might think or might infer that a galaxy actually is a, is, a, is a group of planets, right? That's what a galaxy is. It's a, um, a group of planets. Um, and uh, so if you're shipping uh, Samsung galaxies, then you have to say on your documentation that you're shipping phones or tablets or computers, whatever it is. So don't just use uh, product names or, or brands or models. Um, use the actual description of what is sending. The product tariff classification that refers direct from the description. As you put a precise description on your on your invoice, then this is where customs or the customs broker will figure out the HS code. That's the HS code is a tariff code that is used by customs 
to um, uh, account for goods uh, internationally. And it's a key element of uh, customs compliance. So each product has its HS code and is required for customs clearance at destination. And there's, there's ways to look for HS codes. We won't go into that um, because we don't really have the time today. Uh, but it's an important element of customs compliance. Valuation, uh, what I want to share with you here, what I mean by valuation is the fact that uh, when we declare goods in some countries, when we declare goods to customs, to, uh, to, to, to clear them through customs, um, in many countries around the world, we, we, we use, we declare the value of the goods and the shipping costs and the insurance costs. Whereas in Canada and in the US, it's the other way around. We declare the value of the goods only. We don't consider the value or the cost of the freight or of the insurance costs. So that is specific to Canada and the US. So the moral to the story here is if you export products to a customer, to a US customer, and you pay the freight and you pay and you organize the freight and the insurance, um, show it separately on, 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 the, on the invoice, don't include it in the price because you want to be able to declare the appropriate price uh, to, to US customs and that's the cost or the, the sales price without the freight and without the insurance costs. Uh, if you are shipping the same, selling the same product to Europe, then it's okay to show the, to include the freight if it's included in, in, your, in your cost or if you're the one who paid for it. But if you're selling to the US, show it separate. The origin of a product there, uh, you know, sometimes people don't realize that the origin of a product, as far as customs is concerned, is where the product was grown or was, uh, was manufactured or assembled or, or, or made or produced. Uh, it, it's not necessarily where you bought it from. Um, and so I like to illustrate this with the famous Swiss army knife, which everybody knows about, right? The Swiss army knife is, is uh, well known around the world. You could be a Swiss company selling Swiss army knives, um, including on, on the internet via e-commerce and uh, have them made in China, right? So here I could be in Canada buying a, a Swiss army knife online from a Swiss company. Um, and uh, if that Swiss company had it made in China, then that product keeps its origin. It's a product of Chinese origin, even though I bought it from a Swiss company, and even though it's a Swiss, uh, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it represents a, a Swiss product. But so it's important to know the origin of the product stays with the product even when it changes hands. So. If you have great food products that are 100% grown and made and produced in Alberta, of course, that's fine. You don't have to worry about that. But I just wanted to um, share this with you so that you know about this notion. Um, there's many Canadian companies that import products in bulk and then resell them uh, individually uh, online. And uh, there they would keep their original origin they wouldn't necessarily be Canadian, even though they, they might be uh, sold from Canada or packaged from Canada. So origin is important. IP, intellectual property. Of course, if you use a brand, an image, a logo, you have to make sure that you, either you own it or that you have the authorization from the brand owner or, or the logo owner. Your pro the product that you're sending, that you're selling, indeed has to be legitimate. If, if you're selling Louis Vuitton bags on the internet, then they have to be genuine Louis Vuitton bags, right? They can't be imitations because otherwise then that's, that's uh, counterfeit, contraband. Uh, so be aware of that. Um, and uh, uh, the other aspect of intellectual property I wanted to illustrate briefly was the fact that to protect ourselves when we start selling overseas, sometimes depending on the nature of our product and, uh, and its value and its uniqueness, uh, it could be advisable to file, um, to, to protect your intellectual property in the markets that you're going to be selling to. So if you're selling, if you're going to sell a lot to the US, you might want to uh, file your IP with the um, US Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, same if you're selling in the European Union, you might want to register with the UIPO to, to have your, your, your IP protected in all 27 EU countries. So 
it's something to think about when we export in general. It's not specific to e-commerce, it's just something to know about and to, to think about in our, in our export strategy. Just to illustrate uh, how uh, IP works, I, I like to use the example of um, this famous couple who I think live, and then I think they moved out of Canada. Uh, I'm not sure why. But uh, um, they, um, these, these fine couple, uh, actually register their brand, the Sussex Royal brand, in order to be able to sell, protect it, to be able to sell, you know, uh, souvenirs and whatnot um, uh, using their logo and their brand. So this is why companies, or one of the illustrations of why people and companies register their trademark. Now let's touch on the freight and customs aspect. And so here, what I, what I wanted to share with you briefly is the um, something called the IncoTerms rules. We had a training not long ago on IncoTerms rules. Um, so you may have, some of you may have followed it. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I think when we do business overseas, um, even if it's by e-commerce, then we should be familiar with Incoterms rules. So there are rules that define the obligations of the, of the parties, who arranges for what, who pays for what when it comes to delivering the merchandise. Um, they also deal with the sharing of risks. There are three letter abbreviations. There's 11 three letter abbreviations. They are here uh, on, this, uh, on the screen. And where do we put the Incoterm? Well, we put it next to the price. Uh, so whenever we give a price to a client, we should it should be we should have an equal term attached to it that would say what is included in the price and what is not included. Does it include shipping or does it not include shipping, for example? And, and then we would show the equal term on 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 the subsequent um, exchanges and documentation that we might produce uh, for that sale. Um, so there's eleven equal terms. I won't spend any time on it. I just want to show them to you very briefly. There's four maritime inco terms. Don't worry about those. We don't use them unless unless you're shipping stock to a distribution center overseas. And then, of course, you would come across these uh, inco terms. But the ones that are of interest to us are the seven multimodal inco terms. And out of these, don't worry. I just want to share to, to show show you which ones, which of uh, three of them, which are would be pertinent for e-commerce. The first one is the uh, is FCA. And so you would use that if your price is only the price of your goods or of your product and does not include any freight or customs or insurance cost. There you would give, when you give a price, if it's $1.50 per item, then you'd say next to it, you say $1.50 FCA, High River or FCA Edmonton or FCA wherever you are in Alberta. Uh, and so that would clearly spell out the fact that your price does not include any freight, any shipping, any insurance, any customs, et cetera, et cetera. So that would be the one to use. If you're going to pay the freight uh, and if you're, the price of your item includes the freight but not the customs at destination, then the Inco term to use is DAP, delivered at place. So you would show that next to the price. And if you're paying for everything, if you're paying the, for the freight cost right up to the customer's door and all the customs business, all the customs costs, then it would be DDP, delivered duty paid. Um, so these are the three inco terms I wanted you to be familiar with: FCA, DAP, DDP, depending on the uh, on your situation and how you arrange uh, freight. We'll touch a little bit on shipping in a moment. Um, I wanted to highlight one of the sore points of e-commerce, as I as I um, as I believe. It's, it's a personal opinion, of course, but uh, I think we do have a big issue now with the fact that the big, the big marketplaces, particularly Amazon, has been promoting free shipping um, uh, like crazy, right? They really went all the way for that. So promoting free shipping, uh, promoting free returns is actually... Uh, I think quite damaging for, for businesses because in the end, it's not Amazon who pays the shipping cost, it's the vendor who pays the shipping cost. And uh, it's also the environment that, sh that pays for 
all the uh, wasted packaging uh, for for uh, when when people buy all kinds of stuff online, uh, knowing that uh, if they don't like it, they can return it free of charge. So that creates a lot of waste, and that's uh, highly unfortunate. But that's that's the trend um, nowadays. Um, or at least that's what Amazon has been pushing for, uh, and which I think is very unhealthy, but that's uh, that's how it is. So something to know about, uh, speaking of shipping costs, is there's been various studies being done, but so what I wanted to share with you is the fact that uh, shipping costs in, 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 uh, in e-commerce, in the e-commerce model, are, usually, are, are about double the standard shipping costs that are, that are uh, incurred in, in traditional retail. A traditional retailer um, logistics costs count for about five, six, seven percent of, uh, of, of sales, maybe eight percent in some cases. Via e-commerce, the logistics costs, shipping costs can, can go as far as high as 15 percent, even 20 percent. Uh, of course, it depends on the nature of the product. So. Uh, I, what I wanted to share here, share with you here, is the fact that yes, shipping is uh, is important because we, when we sell by e-commerce, we tend to spend more on shipping because of the nature of the transactions, because the transactions are individual. Uh, so logistics costs in the end are, are much higher than if we are a traditional retailer. When we sell to the U.S. Uh, our first uh, export market. We'll touch here a little bit briefly on on customs issues to make you familiar with a few things. So when we when we sell goods in the U.S., they have to go through customs. We saw that a moment ago. A customs broker has to be involved, has to clear the goods through customs. Many of the courier companies that uh, that service the industry uh, do this themselves, do this in-house, and they make us sign something to give them the authority to do so. If we we're looking for customs brokers in the U.S., uh, one a good way to do that would be to look it up on the U.S. Customs and Border Protection website. They have um, all this information on hand. Of course, it's it's normal. Um, briefly, the types of documents and processes that are used in the U.S. Uh, what we call a consumption entry is is, you, is issued by the U.S. Customs broker for values of twenty five hundred dollars and more. So. We would very seldom uh, have this in e-commerce, but it could still happen. So that's that's the process that's followed. That's the form of CBP 7501. Uh, it's the import declaration in the US. If we have a shipment uh, that is valued under $2,500 and it's called an informal entry, so it's a different form. It's a easier and faster, faster process. Um, and the important thing for e-commerce, for Canadian retailers, uh, uh, is the fact that in the US there's a pre pretty high uh, value threshold for duty and tax exemption. So that threshold went up a few years back from $200 to $800. So today, if you're selling goods to a US customer that is worth, that is, and your sales price is $800 US dollars or less, the shipment will come in free of charge or free of duties and taxes in the US. It follows uh, a, a simplified customs process. And uh, it, so it's very beneficial for the for US customers um, because um, they can buy uh, products online as long as they don't exceed 800 US dollars per transaction. They pay no duties and taxes. So something very advantageous for uh, Canadian exporters um, for for e-commerce Canadian e-commerce vendors, the threshold in Canada is twenty dollars, with the exception of uh, um, NAFTA goods or Kuzma goods, and there the threshold there is fifty dollars for GST and one hundred and fifty dollars for taxes. So, export into the U.S. eight hundred dollars um, under eight hundred um, eight hundred U.S. dollars or $800 US and less than no duties and taxes. And so that is called, in, in US customs language, is called section 321. And so why do I say that? Because it's good to show that on your documentation. You know, when you fill out instructions to your, to your trucker or to your express company, um, mention somewhere that the customs clearance must be done under section 321 because that automatically tells them what type of entry they're going to use. And uh, 
and that will be then the, the product that comes in duty free uh, for the customer. So very advantageous. Don't consolidate shipments, um, or sorry, no, don't split shipments. If you have a sale, uh, if you have a US client that buy, that buys uh, $1,500 worth of goods, don't split it in two shipments in order to come under the $800 because if you get caught, you'll pay a huge penalty to customs. And I found here to illustrate that an example of a UK company that has been caught and uh, they were caught splitting shipments to so that their individual shipments would come would, would fall under the $800 and this way they saved on customs duties or their customers save on customs duties. So don't do that. The $800 US uh, limit is per transaction, per customer, per day. However, what you can do to save costs uh, when you export to the US, uh, including by e-commerce, is you can consolidate shipments. If you have several orders for e-commerce clients, you can put them together and ship them as one unit. And uh, um, Avid goes through customs it's cleared as one entry, it's still declared individually, but it's cleared as one entry. So you save on broker, broker costs. And you could also save on the distribution cost if you have an agreement with a US parcel carrier to so that you package and label the products, uh, the orders, so that they can be split after their um, clear customs at the border. And then they can be split and distributed through the, as a, as a US domestic shipment. So that's a way of saving on distribution costs in the US. Something that quite a few Canadian companies do when they can, of course. Speaking again about the US, I wanted to alert you to the fact that uh, we talked at the beginning about the fact that governments were catching up or were, were, were enacting regulations to catch up to the loopholes that were created by this uh, huge increase in e-commerce. And one of them is the, is, uh, the fact that uh, individual as, as, uh, states uh, in the US uh, with the growth of e-commerce, they realized that they, they were losing a lot of money on sales tax. Um, and so they've caught up to that. There's been a court decision that came in in 2018 that have paved the way for US individual states to force um, e-commerce e uh, vendors to charge the sales tax to their final customer and to pay it back to the state government. So um, quite a few states have passed legislation. So it's something to be aware of if you have, and these uh, each state has a slightly different um, way of doing it. In some states, uh, it's based on the um, turnover per year. Um, several states have a, a, a threshold, turnover threshold of $100,000. And so as soon as you exceed uh, sales um, of $100,000, then you have an obligation to register for the sales tax and you have an obligation to, to collect it from your US customer and to pay it back to the government. Of course, on the other hand, if you exceed $100,000 in any given uh, individual state, then that's good news. It means you're doing good business. But I want you to be aware of the fact that uh, it's an obligation that you have. Uh, and so in some states, it's based on the number of transactions. Um, like Alabama, I think it's as soon as you have more than 200 transactions a year. So in the previous year, if you had, as soon as you exceed 200 transactions, then the following year, you have to register for sales tax. You have to collect it from your um, customers in that state. So something to be aware of. Um, it's relatively new, so it's still evolving. Um, now what I wanted to show you also, remember at the beginning I said uh, Europe is our second biggest market after the US. Uh, it represents about 10% of our exports. So there what's interesting in Europe is the European Union is a, is a, is a customs union. And so you can sell to uh, customers in any of the 27 countries of the European Union, and then they only go through customs once, and they can be distributed throughout Europe from a single distribution center. So you could have a distribution center in Benelux or in the south of Germany or in the north of France and, uh, the, and uh, service European customers in all these 27 countries uh, very easily from a centrally located distribution center. So similarly to the US sales tax, I wanted to, to 
to basically to tell you a little bit about the VAT tax in Europe. And so it is um, something important to know about if you want to develop business in Europe. It's very um, easy also because of the CETA free trade agreement we have with the European Union. And because the EU is a, is a customs union of 27 countries. But one thing you have to be aware of is the VAT, the value added tax. And so there, to manage the value added tax, uh, what is uh, important is to hire a fiscal representative in Europe who will look after uh, the filing of VAT declarations for your stock and for your sales in Europe. So something to be um, aware of and uh, an important tool to develop business in Europe for Canadian e-commerce retailers. I wanted to touch very briefly on shipping before uh, we end uh, this webinar. So we're not going to ship uh, our goods by ocean freight, except if we send them by, if we send them ahead of time to a distribution center, of course. We're gonna use trucks, we're gonna use planes. Uh, very often we'll use, we won't deal directly with an airline, we won't deal directly with a trucking company. Very often we'll deal with a 3PL, we'll deal with a freight forwarder or a broker of some sort or we'll deal with what, um, what we call in the logistics industry, we call these companies integrators. And uh, so very often, yes, we'll deal with a FedEx or a UPS or, or Purator or Canada Post um, to handle our shipments. What's, what is, um, what is uh, important here is that, um, particularly with companies like FedEx or UPS, um, they have great service, great coverage, uh, we can ship all over the world with them. However, they're, they're, their pricing has been going up because of the increase in e-commerce and in the demands that it puts on their network. Uh, and so they're sometimes pretty expensive. They're very practical, but pretty expensive. So Canada Post is probably cheaper in many cases, in, or in some cases. Uh, but so one way to deal with these uh, integrators is um, uh, to save costs, is uh, to go through a wholesaler. You know, companies that, uh, that act as wholesalers for these courier companies and for these express companies. And sometimes it's worthwhile. Uh, I noticed that there are um, industry associations um, that uh, uh, pool their resources and negotiate rates either directly with the FedEx and UPS of this world or with a wholesaler who then can generate a saving, uh, you know, by having more purchasing power uh, I mean, you probably know um, as well as I do, if I ship a small parcel to, uh, to, um, uh, to Miami or to London or to Tokyo, as an individual, it might cost me $100 uh, using uh, UPS or FedEx or DHL. And if I was Amazon, it might cost me only $10. So there's huge differences in pricing. And so the way to deal with this when we begin, when we are small, is to try to find a way to, to connect with a wholesaler either directly or through an industry association. And it's possible to generate good savings this way. The other way, the other thing I wanted to point out is that yes, these companies, um, when we shop around for pricing, they have different limits of liability. They also have sometimes different ways of calculating volume weights. And so we have to look carefully at their at their terms and conditions and also at the way they price um, shipments. So here, what I wanted to show with you here to show you here is the and highlight the fact that carriers have limits of liability. So we always have to keep this in mind. If our trucker loses our shipment, or if uh, if an airline doesn't deliver our goods, or, or if we send goods by ocean and the, the container falls in the water, uh, carriers always have limits of liability. They, they vary depending on the mode of transportation. If a trucker uses, loses your shipment in Canada, the maximum he will give you back is $4.41 a kilo. If an airline loses your shipment, the maximum they'll pay you back is between $30 and $40 a kilo. That's kind of in their terms and conditions. The courier companies have the same um, situation and they, um, they have limits of liability that you'll find in the fine print of their, sh of their shipping um, way bills. And it's not necessarily uniform. FedEx might have a $60 pound uh, maximum liability and UPS might have a, 
uh, a maximum liability of $100 per package. So sometimes it's based on weight, sometimes it's based on package. It also depends on the type of service you purchase from them. So two ways to deal with that, two options, two things we can do. Declare the value for carriage on the way bill, uh, and then that will cover you for that declared value, for the value of your goods. But then you'll pay a premium, you'll pay an additional cost, uh, like an insurance cost, and it's usually at least 2% of the, of the value that you declare. So that's one way of protecting yourself that cancels. If you show a declared value on your, on your shipping bill, then that cancels the limit of liability. It makes the carrier responsible for the full amount of the, of the, of the transaction. Uh, the second option, which I think is, is, more, uh, is more, more efficient and cheaper, uh, but only if, if you have a certain volume, of course, uh, is to uh, contract insurance separately, uh, connect with an insurance company, an insurance broker, an insurance agent, and uh, make it uh, get an open policy from him or her in order to have your shipments covered separately from the, from the, from the freight uh, arrangement. So uh, taking cargo insurance this way is more efficient and is also much cheaper. It usually costs less than than half of 1% or about half of 1%. So that's the two ways to protect the, um, the value of your goods when you ship them internationally. Insurance uh, coverage, insurance clauses are pretty uniform. It actually doesn't matter which company you deal with. As far as insurance is concerned, there are international um, clauses that are used by, by um, all insurance companies. Um, so one of them here is the Institute Car Clause A. That's just for information. That's what you should procure if you want to take insurance separately from the carrier's declared valuation tool. <clears throat> Briefly, I wanted to touch on free trade agreements because uh, uh, we might be running out of time. Um, so we have free trade agreements with, with several countries. The biggest one, the one that's the most important to us is the uh, North American Free Trade Agreement, which has been renamed the USMCA or the KUZMA, uh, depending on which country you look at. So what this means is that when we sell goods to US or Mexican customers, then we generally get, uh, the customer generally doesn't pay duties, doesn't pay tariffs, doesn't pay customs duties. Um, and so it's a, great, it's a great tool to make our products competitive. Um, and, uh, but it comes with the, with, with a provision that uh, the goods must meet the rules of origin. So we have to be a little bit familiar with that um, and uh, make sure that our products are entitled to the uh, free trade agreement uh, um, tariff treatment, preferential tariff treatment. Um, and so the other thing that we, that we have to know about is that once we know, once we verify that our goods are qualified for that free trade agreement, then we should produce um, some sort of origin certification so that the customer can show that to customs so that customs can see that when the goods go through customs you know, in, in order to give us the preferential treatment. So it's a good habit to in, include that in your commercial invoice. Put a little statement as, as when you know that your goods meet the rules of origin, i.e. your goods have been grown in Canada or um, have a sufficient Canadian content to qualify for the free trade agreement, put a little sentence on the invoice to say that uh, your goods qualify for the free trade agreement. Uh, uh, so this way the customer won't pay tariffs um, when the goods go through customs. Um, the other um, information I wanted to share with you is that in addition to the North American free trade agreement with, with the US and Mexico, we also have uh, free trade agreements with these small, smaller countries, Israel, Chile, Costa Rica, etc. And with two large ent entities, the ones that are at the bottom, the, we have a free trade agreement with the European Union, the 27 countries of the European Union since September 2017, and the Trans-Pacific Partnership with Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Vietnam, etc. Uh, um, 11 countries uh, since December 2018. So what that means is that our products get preferential tariff treatment, just like they do in the US, uh, providing they meet the rules of origin and providing we show a little certification to that effect on our commercial invoice. This way our customers 
should not pay duty, should not pay tariffs when, when the goods arrive on the other side. Um, and so that actually took me all, all, almost to the end of what I had prepared for you. So to, to also put the perspective now, I, I tried to share as much information as possible on, um, on the shipping customs and regulation requirements of e-commerce, of exporting via e-commerce. And now to tie it back to what is happening in practice, of course, it's important to know all these things. You, you really have to dig into these things to make sure that you, you that you um, maximize um, the benefits, particularly for free trade agreements, but also so that you are aware of the rules and regulations, so that you don't your shipments don't get stuck at the border, or so that your customers don't pay uh, duties and taxes that they shouldn't have to pay. But of course, in practical terms, and that then relates back to the kind of strategy you're going to use, and so. To summarize this strategy as far as how you're going to use selling online, and so I wanted to summarize them here on this on this slide, just to basically link this a little bit with the um, other information we just talked about. Of course, if you're so that these are the three kind of main ways that we uh, that we will uh, sell um, overseas or uh, export via e-commerce, either having make an agreement with a retailer will add our products to his or her inventory, uh, then that's kind of the easiest way to do it. And, uh, and uh, then that retailer may help us with shipping requirements. Uh, on the other hand, that's pretty limited. Um, and then the other option, which I, I said one, it should be two actually, is uh, the one that um, many, many companies use. If you sell online via, via a marketplace, like an Amazon, for example, so there, um, what is um, what is neat, of course, is that you have great exposure. You have great. Uh, it's a great way to 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 reach uh, a wide um, uh, array of potential customers immediately. But of course, it also comes with strings attached. It also comes with costs, um, and so we'll we'll touch on that in a moment. But so, what I wanted to highlight there is that in some cases. Uh, selling through this online marketplace does not necessarily relieve you from the uh, uh, shipping obligation uh, or for the customs obligation. In fact, in many cases, the marketplace uh, company like Amazon will still leave you to bring the goods over to their uh, distribution center and you will may have the importer uh, requirements on your shoulders. And of course, the third element, the third option is if you create, if you do it yourself, you create your own sales portal, which then requires more investment, more time, and is it, it, it can provides per, perhaps a smaller growth because you have less exposure. Uh, and you also have perhaps more demands on, on shipping and that. But on the other hand, it, it's probably in the long term, it might be more profitable. So whichever way you use, you, you choose, you might have more, you might need more knowledge and more involvement in shipping and customs issue, issues. But I think in, in all cases, you, you need some involvement and some knowledge of uh, how things should be done as for and, and what the requirements are for um, documentation, customs, distribution, et cetera, et cetera. And so in closing, I just had highlighted a few things about formula fulfillment centers and, and warehouses. It's all relatively banal. We can go through that very quickly. I like to highlight the difference between a, a, a typical old style warehouse for traditional retailers, which is usually packed with products. We maximize the use of space for economies of scale. Whereas for e-commerce, it's the exact opposite. Here, we need a lot of space. Uh, we need huge uh, fulfillment centers because we need not just to store products, but we also need to pick and pack them. And we need to package them and label them. So there are totally different styles of operations. They put a lot of demand on, in, on, on, on um, industrial space. On, um, uh, and. Uh, but that's that, that's just how it works. That's um, what I just wanted to highlight the differences between the two styles of operations, and I just picked up a little bit of information which I think is not that um, uh, um, important. Is just uh, some information about the changes uh, in in the in the in the way these fulfillment centers are, are evolving. Is that you know e-commerce started with this uh, with 
the Amazon and, and the likes, building these huge fulfillment centers um, in, in a few um, uh, strategic locations. And now as the business grows, they are uh, having to work with micro fulfillment centers that are smaller and that are closer to the market. So that's basically what is happening out there. Uh, more and more um, distribution centers are used or fulfillment centers are used and we have the mega ones and we have the micro ones that are closer to market and also that allow pickup. Uh, and so there's, a, there's quite a hybrid kind of development we're seeing. And uh, in the end, the big issue here also for fulfillment fulfillment centers is the fact that technology is going to be playing a big role, big part, uh, and uh, the availability of data in order to be able to analyze data, and as well as the um, development of robotics. You know, more and more of these uh, fulfillment centers use robots instead of, of uh, uh, people. That's just how it is. That's just the way the industry is evolving as we see it. Um, over the last year or so. And with this, I'd like to thank you all very much for your attention. I'm sorry that we had some sound issues at the beginning. I hope that uh, um, you were still able to, to hear me fine and that the information provided is clear and useful. And I look forward to having some exchanges with you and uh, uh, answer any questions you may have. So thank you so much for your attention. And uh, I'll pass the microphone over to Evan. All right, thank you, Christian. Uh, we, we certainly made it through. So thanks for toughing it out with the sound issues, everyone. Um, yeah, before we hop into the Q&A, I just wanna highlight another webinar we've got coming up uh, next month, uh, right around the corner here in a couple of weeks with Business Link is putting this one on. And uh, myself and some colleagues are gonna be uh, presenting, uh, diving a little bit deeper into kind of who we are and what we do and how we can help companies. And then um, just uh, some high level agribusiness opportunities and some some key markets for, for Alberta. Uh, you, so you can find this link, uh, this webinar on Eventbrite or reach out to me, of course, and I can fire you the registration information. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll open it up to questions now. Um, I'll look in the chat and see if we have anything, but I know that some questions rolled in uh, in the registration. Um, All right. So, Christian. Excellent. Uh, question for you around counterfeit goods. Um, how does e-commerce facilitate the trade in counterfeit goods and what can be done to fight counterfeiting? Well, how does it facilitate the trading counterfeit goods is simply because of the sheer volumes of e-commerce. Um, it's just uh, impossible for authorities to control every shipment. So, uh, um, you know, with the growth of globalization over the years, we see these huge container ships that are carrying products all over the globe mainly from Asia to North America, uh, but in all directions really. And, you know, customs um, on these container shipments, customs have ways to inspect goods uh, and also to uh, uh, x-ray containers and to uh, uh, check the documentation and isolate uh, potential um, risks, you know, uh, and uh, potential uh, presence of, uh, of counterfeit goods is relatively, uh, it, it's still complex to administer when you're talking about the regular uh, business goods coming in via con by containers, by ocean container. But when uh, you talk about e-commerce, the sheer magnitude of e-commerce, the sheer number of shipments that are going through is such that it's, it's impossible. You can't have a customs officer checking the millions and millions of, of little boxes that are being shipped all over all over the globe every day. You know, it's just impossible to uh, it's impossible to uh, to monitor. Um, or it's not impossible, but it's very challenging. So I think it's just how it is. It's just a, a sheer a game of numbers. If you had, if you needed, if you wanted to control all this, um, it would take so much manpower and or so so, so much um, uh, effort, such an effort that uh, it, it's just it's just done on a random basis, you know, uh, and uh, and so as a result, uh, a lot of people are taking advantage of that and shipping um, counterfeit goods uh, this way. 
because they have less chances of getting caught. And, and there's a lot of money to be made in doing that. Um, and so that's why a lot of that uh, happens. And it's very detrimental to um, the companies that own brands because uh, their brands can be um, misused this way relatively easily, I would say. Right. Okay. Unfortunately. It happens, certainly. Um, another question. Um, so a company asked if they, they need to know more about FDA compliance for shipping to the US and the EU. So where would they find this information? Well, there you'll have, uh, you'll have to um, bite the bullet and, and look into the FCA, FDA uh, regulations. I mean, it's all published online. It's quite, quite, uh, it, it's quite huge. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of uh, information to go through to, to uh, a lot of uh, info to, to, to sort out, but uh, yeah, you have to, you have to start by seeing what is available uh, become familiar with the Food Safety Modernization, Modernization Act. Uh, maybe see if a specialist can help you. Uh, it's possible that, uh, for example, the Alberta government uh, is, is helping exporters. They may have resources within uh, their, um, their teams that have uh, knowledge about uh, these uh, FDA requirements that might help you get started. Uh, and then you also have um, the Alberta offices overseas or, or in the States, and they, they might be able to help you. The, the, uh, the trade commissioners will be able to help you as well. And then, you know, um, people who are, in the, who are in the food industry, like consultants or trade associations might be able to help you as well um, to navigate through these rules. But it's just, we're, we're, we're stuck with it. We have to, uh, to go through the process and see what the, what the requirements are. There's just no way around it. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Reach out to us and, and we can uh, assist any way we can. Um, so a question around uh, packaging and handling. Uh, so who, who pays for that? And is there a quick way to do kind of bulk or umbrella uh, type shipments for many small packages uh, shipped at the same time, but going to different locations within the US? Yes, absolutely. You can do that. Uh, you can do that by two ways. You can have uh, have a um, find a three PL uh, that will um, uh, offer you space in a distribution center to which you can send uh, you know a bulk shipment of of, of fifty boxes of your product. Uh, clear them, go through customs as one transaction, and then have them at a 3PL that you know have a little stock in the US in your name. Uh, it's quite fine to do that. Many companies do that. And then afterwards from that distribution center, then you dispatch them to, to your customers. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a way, so it's, it's like building a little inventory. Uh, and uh, so you have to be careful when you do that, that you don't create uh, fiscal obligations, but um, it's, uh, it's quite possible to do that. And there's a lot of companies that are equipped to do that in, in the 3PL business, in the shipping business, companies that offer that kind of service. You know, warehousing distribution, you ship your pallet or your, your, you ship a truckload to, to, to a distribution center, and then it's dispatched as individual shipments to each customer. It's quite possible to do that. Okay, and I, and I have another question. Um, I don't think this was touched on in the, the webinar today, but around export licenses. Yes. How do you know if you need one? And- uh, Well- Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Christian. So how, how do you know if you need an export license? I, I'm sorry, I lost the sound for a sec for a few seconds. Oh, no problem. Uh, the question was kind of, how do I know if I need an export license? Right, well, there you go. So you have to, the first step would be to look up on global affairs, look for export controls, and then you'll have a list of, uh, of industries or products uh, where, that are clearly identified as requiring an export license. That's, that's the first step really. Um, is uh, see what the Canadian regulations are 
And then if you're talking about the US, then on the US side, there could be licensing requirements. And there we have to check, for example, in the FDA, on the FDA website, uh, see what the FDA regulations are for. Um, uh, one of the uh, points I was mentioning, the foreign supplier verification program, it's, it's not a license, it's not, a, it's not, but it's similar to a license. It means that the, the, the Canadian company that wants to sell in the US has to be registered with the FDA and has to fill out, uh, has to fulfill some conditions and, uh, and has to renew that every year. So you have to look in both directions, see what are the requirements in Canada. Uh, and that will be administered by global affairs. And also what's the requirements in the country of destination in the US, it would be the FDA. Okay, and the last question I've got currently, mm -hmm. um, do you typically work with a broker or distributor to export goods to the, to the States? I think if you do traditional exporting, yes. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of almost unavoidable if you're selling to industrial customers or you know, uh, chains of supermarket or, or chain of restaurants when, when they reopen. Uh, but if you're selling via e-commerce, it's totally different. I mean, there, I think most people sell direct and they put their efforts on uh, um, increasing the awareness of their brand by having a, a neat website and also this way. Uh, so I think, yes, using an agent or, or distributor is not really that common uh, when you talk about e-commerce. I think it's more, it's used more for traditional exporting to industrial customers, to B2B. But B2C, I think we don't usually use, uh, use agents or distributors. Okay, thank you, Christian. Um, and I guess uh, one additional question. Um, what third party freight storage or consolation places uh, do you recommend? I think that's probably focused for the US. I don't know if you have any on top of mind. I, I can't recommend any because, uh, but, but there's, there's many of them that offer that service. Um, and I think there, I wouldn't hesitate to reach out to, um, for example, the Canadian Trade Commissioner Office, you know, the Canadian Trade Delegates uh, or the Alberta Delegates uh, in the States and ask them, who do they know? Who do they come across the, often um, for these types of, uh, of, uh, of operations? I mean, they, there's, there's many of them. They're usually associated with, a, uh, with trucking companies or with logistics companies. I mean, you could also reach out to, there's also Canadian resources that can help you out, for example, the Canadian International Freight Forwarders Association can can um, can provide you with some good information on that. Uh, they may even have information on that on their websites, on their website. Sorry. Yes. But I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to recommend a specific one because um, I want to I have to stay neutral. That's right. I'm mostly just testing you with that one, I guess. Good answer to to check with us. Check with your local governments and provincial governments. We can uh, poke around for you guys. Uh, we look, a question came through on the chat there, Christian. You can probably see it yes. uh, from Tiffany. So the under $800 USD exemption you spoke of for e-commerce sales to the US, does that limit apply? A customer pays no tax or duty, regardless of the origin of the goods. So this particular person will have their products manufactured overseas in Colombia or Europe, and then imported into Canada for sale to Canadian and US markets. Yes, um, so um, absolutely, it applies to all goods across the board, no matter what the origin is. Um, and so uh, when your product uh, is coming from Colombia into Canada, and then is being reshipped from Canada to the US, the important thing to know is that you still have to declare Colombian origin. You can't say Canadian origin because that would be a false declaration. And if customs catch it, They'll, they'll issue you a penalty. So the origins of where the product was made stays, and uh, but it, it but it will but it will benefit from the same eight hundred dollar exemption because it's an, it's an exemption that's across the board, no matter where the goods come from. 
All right. Absolutely. Uh, so I think with that, we're, we're right at the time and uh, we'll wrap things up. So thanks again, Christian, for, for taking the time and take, walking us through that webinar and uh, appreciate everyone for joining in today. Thank you very much for the invitation. I hope it was interesting and I wish you uh, the best of luck for developing your e-commerce, uh, your exporting um, uh, via e-commerce and uh, uh, stay safe as well and healthy. Perfect. Thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, goodbye for now. And I'll send out the, re the recording in a couple of days. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.